Well, we have a special treat today for you. Um, our worship leader, Chris Kim, is going to be giving our message today. Super exciting. Um, it is uh, an opportunity to hear um, he's going to be talking about why God wants us to give thanks. And I think you'll see um, it's kind of what he exudes as he leads us in worship here on stage, coming out in words and his heart. Um, so a portion of the scripture this morning will be from Psalm chapter 50, verses 7 through 15. Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Thank you, Cindy. Man, I hope you guys don't think I love being on stage or something, because I don't. <laughs> Even when they make me do the announcements, I'm like really stressed out. So we'll see how this goes. But I hope you guys all had a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know uh, we did. Uh, we got to enjoy the time with some of our uh, family members in the area, some close friends. Uh, we actually invited one of my daughter's classmates' families who are from Europe, and they don't celebrate Thanksgiving. So that was really cool. Uh, we showed them a very typical American Thanksgiving meal of Cuban mojo pork and <laughs> beans and fried plantains. Um, as you can guess, I'm not a big fan of turkey. Who, actually, who, has, who didn't eat turkey this week? Yeah. Uh, gr <laughs> growing up in my family, we rarely had turkey for Thanksgiving. Um, one, we, we didn't like it much. But two, actually, I think it's because my parents had never used an oven before. <laughs> uh, when people would come over to our house and they would want to bake cookies or something, they would preheat the oven. And when it gets to temp, they open it and find just a bunch of platters and plates and stuff that have now become too hot to take out. Uh, one time we actually did finally have turkey was when my dad discovered you can deep fry one of these things. Uh, so we got the big old pot and gallons of oil or whatever and went through the whole ordeal and we found out it just makes the outside a little crispy, but the inside is still turkey. Uh, so yeah, turkey sucks. Uh, but something my, my dad did do every Thanksgiving was, um, I think I would call it the circle of Thanksgiving. I'm sure you guys have done something like this. Uh, is when you basically go around a table and saying what you're thankful for. And I remember hating this growing up, uh, mainly because I hated anything like we, that had to do with feelings. But uh, I was also just a punk kid growing up. And uh, although my cousins would say meaningful stuff like, oh, I'm thankful for my family and my, my um, friends or whatever, all the good stuff, I would sit there and say like, oh yeah, I'm thankful that I passed this the last level on this video game or something that would you know, upset my dad. Um, but looking back now, I can appreciate why he did this. For whatever reason, it was important for him that we not only felt grateful, but knew how to express thanksgiving. It wasn't just to be polite or well-mannered, and we weren't showing off our, our gratitude skills or anything like that. We weren't even thanking each other but there was something special that happened when we gave thanks amongst each other. So today we're gonna to be talking about Thanksgiving, uh, but not the how or the when or even the why, but the why God. Why does God want us to give thanks and give thanks to him? I don't know if you ever thought about that. Uh, and when, whenever someone says why God anything, you should be extra skeptical because we're claiming to know the intentions of God. So just make sure I'm, I'm uh, speaking from the Bible and not anything else. Uh, but no matter what culture you're from, uh, we're taught to express gratitude at a very young age. It's one of the first phrases you learn in any language. Thank you. 
Uh, this is because the world recognizes that the benefits uh, of Thanksgiving are just too real, uh, not just feeling, but to express. I found a website that listed these reasons that all of us should learn to express gratitude. Uh, one, it builds social skills and relationships. That's kind of obvious. Uh, but two, it also is good for your physical health. Apparently, it uh, causes people who are thankful are, are known to have fewer headaches and pains. It's also good for your psychological health. Studies have shown it reduces depression and other mental illnesses. And lastly, uh, apparently, it leads to better job satisfaction if you are expressively grateful at work. But even from a spiritual standpoint, we're often taught many reasons to give thanks to God. It leads to joy, it deepens our faith, it guards against envy and arrogance. And these are all good things. But are they really the main reasons why God tells us so many times to give thanks to him? He tells us in the Bible over a hundred times to do this. And not just that, it's something we probably do regularly, especially if you've been attending Current for a while, you uh, come every Sunday, we give thanks to God in our, in our worship like we did this morning. I'm sure a lot of you say thanks uh, before meals or before bedtime. But why does God want us to do this? Why does he tell us to do this? Is it just so we could experience those spiritual benefits? Is there anything in it for him? From a parent's perspective, when I tell my kids to say thank you, when they get something, it's usually because I don't want the person to think I'm a bad parent. Uh, or like I don't want them to stop giving them stuff. But why does God tell his children, us, to give thanks? Is it just so we could improve our spiritual lives? Or is there more to it? I believe our passage today, uh, which is Psalm 50, gives us a few clues as to why God might want us to give him thanks. And here's a hint, it's not really about us after all, it's about him. Before I do that, let me say a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for gathering us this morning. Thank you so much for giving us your word and teaching us and revealing to us a bit about your heart. God, who are we to know the intentions of the creator? But God, you have spelled it out for us, and I pray that today your word will be heard and that we'd go uh, changed and uh, knowing you a bit more today. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. All right, so why does God want us to give him thanks? I believe Psalm 50 gives us three reasons, which I'm going to tell you right now just in case. Uh, God wants us to give him thanks so that, one, he would be relied on, Two, he could be honored. And three, that he might be known. That he, he would be relied on, he could be honored, and that he would be known. All right, we're going to dig into the text. It's kind of long, so bear with me, but we're going to get through it together. Psalm 50 should be on the screen. All right, the mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. So to summarize these three, these three verses, uh, God summons all the earth. He approaches from a place called Zion, which is the capital city of Israel. And it's loud. Uh, basically, <laughs> something big and important is about to go down. Uh, let's continue. In verse 4, he summons the heavens above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. By the way, uh, more literally, it's, it's he is God the judge. And verse 7, listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. So now he not only summons the earth, but the heavens. Right, basically, all of creation is gathered together to witness what's about to happen, this big event. And what's pictured here is a courtroom setting, right? It's a trial. And the people on trial are not the, the wicked 
people of the earth or, or the enemies of Israel or even the pagans that, you know, blaspheme his name or anything like that. It's his very own chosen people who seem to be on trial. They're in front of God who is both, in verse 6, the judge, and verse 7, the prosecutor. For he says, I will testify against you. So what is God's testimony against Israel? Let's see, verse 8. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. Sounds pretty good. But I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? It's a rhetorical question. So to add some context here, I think it's, it's helpful to know a little bit about Old, Old Testament sacrifices. Back in that time, uh, God's people, the Israelites, were given a, a ton of laws and instructions. These are found in the book of Leviticus, basically like the early parts of the Bible. Um, and they were given to them as a way to, to live as God's chosen people. This is how they separated themselves from the rest of the world. And part of these laws included offerings and sacrifices. These were often animals that they would burn at the altar to the Lord. Uh, sometimes they would bring grain or, or wine even if they couldn't afford animals. And some of them were done daily, some were annual. Basically there was a ton of instructions on these offerings. But the majority of the sacrifices were made for the atonement or the payment of the sins that they committed. There's a lot more to it, but for today's sake, what we need to understand is one, these sacrifices, they show that there is real cost to sin. That trespassing against God doesn't just go unpunished or else God wouldn't be a just God. Also, that these, there were a lot of instructions, like I said earlier. Uh, for example, it has to be like a priest who is sanctified and, and purified, who goes in and washes himself and all that. There's a lot of um, steps to do before you can even make a sacrifice. And lastly, they had to keep doing it because, well, they kept sinning. So let's go back to what we just read. What's God saying here? He says, good job with all your sacrifices and offerings. You did them correctly. But then his tone changes, right? He says, all those sacrifices you offered, all those animals and goats and bulls that you continuously offered me, I don't need any of them. I own literally everything in the world. What good are your animals? When I read this, I imagined myself uh, speaking to my daughter, who in general is a really good kid, actually like pretty much the ideal six-year-old. But even she, when she, when she does things that I ask of her, like brushing her teeth or cleaning her room, uh, she thinks she's doing it for me, when in fact it's for her own benefit. I always tell her, you brush your teeth or else the bugs are gonna come in the middle of the night and eat the food in your mouth. <laughs> actually, one thing that my daughter really wants for us is to buy a Tesla. <laughs> um, I blame this mostly on my parents because they, they recently bought one, and by recently I mean like two years ago, but they talk about it like it's yesterday. Uh, they, would, they would always come to visit and take my daughter around, and I think during those rides they would just like, you know, secretly tell her, like, hey, tell your dad to buy one too. <laughs> I don't know why, right? I think it's because they're embarrassed uh, that that we drive this 14-year-old Prius. Um, but it started getting annoying, and I had to keep explaining to my daughter, like, you can't just get one because you, you want one. Teslas cost money. Well, over New Year's, uh, in Korean culture, kids often get, um, they get cash from their elders. And Ali got, our, my daughter got about $30 at one time, and what I didn't expect was for her to come up to me and say, Daddy, you can have my $30 and finally buy a Tesla. 
This is probably how God felt when all the Israelites gave <laughs> offerings to him. And little did my daughter know, I already pocketed her cash, so it was mine anyway. So it's like... So if God doesn't need our sacrifices, what does he even want from us? Or what can we, what can we even give? Well, let's see in the next two verses. He says, sacrifice, thank offerings to God, fulfill your vows to the Most High, and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Well, if you're paying attention, hopefully some questions come to mind. Like, didn't he just say he doesn't need sacrifices? And then he right away says, sacrifice something. Also, what the heck are these vows? Are we supposed to make vows? And uh, what is a thank offering anyway? Well, let's start from the top. Why does he say he doesn't need sacrifices and then tell us to offer something called a thank offering? To understand this, it helps if we know a little bit more about what a thank offering is. I mentioned earlier that most sacrifices were done for the sake of making payment for your sins, for their sins at the time. Well, thank offerings actually were not done for this reason at all. It was part of a different category of offerings, which were called peace offerings. I know the name peace offering could be misleading because uh, if you're like me, you think of like a husband bringing flowers to his wife because he forgot their anniversary. Here's a peace offering. Uh, this is not that. This is actually the opposite, is not to obtain peace, but to celebrate existing peace. They weren't even required. Peace offerings were completely voluntary. You did them out of your free will. So, okay, a thank offering was a type of peace offering. But what made thank offerings extra unique was that this was the only one where the animal that was sacrificed wasn't just offered to God, but actually it was enjoyed as a feast with wine by the person who brought it with, the, with their friends and family. Right? That's pretty relevant, huh? Okay, so thank offerings were voluntary offerings that people gave to say thank you. But what about the vows? What are these vows? Well, back in those days, some people would make a vow to God when they were asking for something particularly desperate. In Psalm 66, the psalmist writes, I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. A vow is something you made when you were in trouble. I imagine some of us have prayed something like this in the past. Oh God, please, I promise to go to church every Sunday if you just let me pass this test that I didn't study for because I was goofing off or whatever. Except these vows were made in public ceremony. There was accountability and they made sure you fulfilled your vows. Because after all, this is how you declare what God had done for you. An example of a vow in the Bible is of a, a woman named Hannah who was barren, and she vowed to dedicate her son to God if God granted her one. Well, God granted her a son named Samuel who would go on to be the prophet, and she did as she vowed and dedicated him to the temple, and he grew up there from birth. So is God saying here that he wants us to make vows like Hannah did? I'm actually gonna show you that this is not the case. Actually, there's another example of a vow in the Bible, a dude named Jephthah in the book of Judges. He vowed to give God whatever came out of his house if God would grant him victory in battle and he would return home victorious. Well, God did grant Israel victory that day, and Jephthah, in his cockiness, came home. But what he did not expect was that the first to come out to greet him would be his daughter. Did God want him to make that vow? Of course not. In fact, did God want anyone to make these vows? Did any of these vows compel God to do what he did? Would God have kept Samuel from being born if Hannah didn't you know, make her promise? 
I don't think so. Did God change the outcome of Israel's battle because of Jephthah's careless vow? Of course not. All these things God would have done anyway. God is not telling us to make vows. I was like, what the heck is he saying? If you look closely, you'll see that he doesn't say make vows, but to fulfill your vows. Meaning God's part is already done. He says, consider your most desperate request already granted. But if we didn't make these vows to begin with, how does he want us to fulfill them? Well, the answer is to give thanks. He says, sacrifice a thank offering. God doesn't need our sacrifices or our vows. He has already granted us our most desperate request. All he wants us to do is to give him thanks. And we look at verse 15. And call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Fulfill your vow through thanksgiving, and he will save you. Call on him, and he will deliver you. And this is where we get our first point. God wants us to thank him so that he would be relied on. That's what he wants. He wants to be relied upon. This could be a strange concept to some of us, at least for me. Uh, if you're like me at all, uh, receiving gifts or favors are sometimes equal parts joy and burden. Uh, my whole family, we were just never good recipients for some reason. There was so much pressure to give back uh, something equal or better whenever we receive. Even now when people give us stuff, we sometimes look up the price online, <laughs> right? Anyone else do this? Yeah, it's terrible. But sometimes we just don't know how to respond, uh, even to God who gives us the greatest gifts. But he's not expecting something equal in return or even anything remotely close. He wants us to give thanks and to continue depending on him. When I started college a while back, I moved out of home for the first time and moved out all the way an hour away. It wasn't, <laughs> actually it was a LA hour, so with traffic it's like three hours. But one thing I quickly realized after a few weeks was that I had no idea how to do laundry. Uh, they had machines in the dorms, but there were all these like powders and buttons and stuff, and I just like couldn't figure it out. Um, and even, even still, I don't really know how it works. But I went as long as I could with the few clothes that I had until I finally decided, okay, this is like kind of gross. I need to go back home. And I asked my mom to wash my clothes. And I expected her to be annoyed or even disappointed, but actually her response was quite the opposite. She wanted me to come back every weekend so she can wash my clothes every week. <laughs> All she wanted from me was gratitude and dependence. I think in some ways this is kind of like the relationship God wants us to have with him. He wants to provide for us, and all he wants from us is gratitude. So God wants us to give him thanks so that we would rely on him. But why does he want us to rely on him? Same verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. And that's our second point. This one's a little more straightforward. God wants us to give him thanks so that we could give him honor, so that he could be honored. The end goal of our thanksgiving and dependence is to honor him. This might sound kind of obvious, but consider what we just heard, right? Uh, he's gonna come and judge his people, uh, they have sins that they couldn't atone for because all their sacrifices were useless, even though they did them correctly. But God says that somehow, even as sinners, there's a way for us to honor him. This becomes more clear as we finish out the rest of the chapter below. Now, before I said that first part, it was easy to kind of imagine saying to my daughter, I found this next part helpful to imagine saying to my two younger boys, as you'll see. But to the wicked person, God says, what right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him and throw in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. 
You sit and testify against your brother and slander your own mother's son. When you did these things you, and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. But now I arraign you and I set my accusation before you. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. For those, those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me and to the blameless I will show my salvation. All right, so minus all the adultery stuff, most of it felt pretty relevant to <laughs> kind of like hit, hit me in the heart, uh, especially this past week with the long holiday. Anyway, um, but God now turns his, his attention to the wicked among his people, right? These are the ones who forget God. But what does he tell them? In verse 23, those who sacrifice think offerings honor me. It's basically the same thing he told the other group right? Those so-called diligent sacrificers, uh, their end is actually the same as the wicked. They get to honor God through thanksgiving. This is incredible news, actually, that even the wicked sinners can somehow honor God. But something's missing, right? We said they honor him through thanksgiving, but what do they really have to be thankful for? He said he will show his salvation to the blameless, but these people obviously were not blameless. Actually, all they had to look forward to was the punishment. That was spelled out in verse 22. I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. And by the way, this isn't just a random violent metaphor. It's how King David describes his enemies in Psalm 7. He says, save and deliver me from all who pursue me, or they will tear me apart like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Now it is God that has become their enemy. So what good is a salvation if he's only going to reveal it to the blameless? Thankfully, there would come someone who is truly blameless, one who lived the perfect life that we couldn't. The son of God who lived the perfect life so he could become the perfect and final sacrifice on our behalf, paying for our sins once and for all. Hebrews 10 tells us that those sacrifices that the Israelites made, they're nothing more than an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This is because the people making the sacrifices, including the priests, they were guilty of their own sins. They had to make the same sacrifice over and over to no avail until finally Jesus came and offered himself up, as it says in verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In verse 18, it says, where these sins have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all who believe in him have their sins forgiven once and for all. Atonement for sin is no longer necessary. So if this day of judgment comes, or actually I should say when this day of judgment comes, and you find yourself in front of the mighty judge, who he himself accuses you of your sin, what will you say? Will you try to strike a deal with him? Think, God, look at all my good deeds. Or will you appeal to his mercy and plead with him? saying, be mercif merciful to me, God. I didn't know better. If you're in Christ today and you believe in his sacrifice for your sins, we can find ourselves in front of God and say, your honor, I call for this case to be dismissed because the punishment has already been dealt when you sent your son, you tore him to pieces and abandoned him to die, and no one came to rescue him. And church family, that is why we give thanks today. Because he gave his son, and because of this, through his sacrifice, though we are sinners, we can yet honor him today. So we're going to wrap up with our third and final point. Why does God want us to give thanks? Thanks so that he might be known. Now, we read the whole chapter, so where's this coming from? 
Well, if you remember the setting of the entire psalm, remember this wasn't just a private meeting in the judge's chambers. He not once, but twice summons all the earth and the heavens to be witness. The call isn't just for us to be grateful, but to outwardly express our thanksgiving to him. Psalm 107 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. About 10 years ago, there was an M NBA player who won the Most Valuable Player Award, and he gave an acceptance speech that actually made headlines. Uh, this was... This was Kevin Durant when he called his mom the real MVP. I don't know if some of you remember this. Um, this was before he became a loser and went to the Warriors. <laughs> but here's an excerpt from his, from his speech. Talking about his mom. Single parent with two boys, he went, we went from apartment to apartment by ourselves. You made us believe. You kept us off the streets. You put clothes on our backs, food on the table, when you didn't eat, you made sure we ate. You went to sleep hungry. You sacrificed for us. You the real MVP. Say what you want, but this was a guy thankful for his mom. And I'm sure she already knew how he felt about her, but he wanted everyone else to know. He wanted to honor her for the sacrifices that she made for him. Now, of course, we don't all have the platform of a superstar athlete. But God has placed us where we are to let our thankfulness be known around us. It could be with your kids or your parents or your other family members, your siblings. Maybe it's your coworkers or, or, or friends or even the community here at Current. What do you want to tell them about your Heavenly Father? Is there anything you're thankful for that you think they should know? How about as a community here at Current? Do we want, well, how do we want others to see us? Do we want to be known as a loving, caring, fun community? Of course. But what if we were also known as a grateful community? Wouldn't that be something? Now then, since we know a bit more about God's heart, how can we offer thanksgiving to him? Well, we can offer thanks through our prayers, considering what he's done for us. Uh, let's continue to call on his name. If you're a perpetual sinner like me, let's come to him with our dependence and his reliance and our reliance on him for his mercy every morning. We can offer thanks through our worship. Consider the privilege of thanksgiving that we as sinners can now bring honor to God. When we sing, let's sing with thanksgiving knowing that our sins have been washed away through the sacrifice of his son. And finally, we can offer thanks with our lives. Consider the power of thanksgiving, that through it, God can lead others to know him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this word. We thank you for the gift of thanksgiving the privilege of thanking you, the power of what it does to those around us that they may know you somehow. Man, what, a, what an amazing thing that we can be part of, God. God, we want to honor you, not because it's dutiful or the right thing to do, but right now, because of what you've done, God, you have given us your son, and you took away our sins. And all that you ask in return is gratefulness. Lord, today we give it, we give it to you now in this time of praise as we continue to sing in our prayers. Lord, we give you thanksgiving, and even in our time of offering, God. May we, do, may we do so in gratitude. And Lord, we offer this time to you and pray that you we're blessed and you are honored. And we lift these things up in your son's name. Amen.